just take a moment to close your eyes and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to gently drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And while I tell this sleep meditation in the background, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice, or perhaps to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, you can have a sense of climbing a mountain. And you're climbing up that mountain towards a monastery that you can see way up high up the side of the mountain. And as you near that monastery, you keep pushing on, increasingly motivated, the crunching snow beneath your feet, the feeling of the cold air on your ears and your cheeks. And you can notice a slight numbness setting in to your fingers. And at this point, that numbness is just a comfortable numbness. Your fingers are well gloved, but just enough cold is getting through to make them feel a slight numbness, just enough to remind your fingers that you're climbing in the cold. And yet, despite that slight numbness in those fingers, you can continue climbing and it just helps you to be aware that you're undergoing this challenge. You've been working really hard up this mountain, striving to get to the top. And this journey hasn't been easy, but that hasn't led to you quitting. You've continued to climb higher and higher. And now that monastery is in sight. And that spurs you on, motivates you to continue your journey. And as you continue that journey, getting closer and closer to the monastery, so you notice some figures walking around outside the monastery. You see that there are some monks just roaming around the outside, each one looking like they're walking in such a measured, purposeful way. And so you watch while you climb at the way they seem to so purposefully be walking around the grounds of the monastery. And as you arrive at the monastery, so you pass through an archway. And almost as soon as you've passed through that archway and the wind seems to die down, seems to calm right down. And your body feels warm from the effort of climbing. And yet those hands still feel a sense of the cold, a slight sense of numbness. And as you touch the hair that's touching your forehead, to move it off your forehead, and your fingers gently touch your forehead, you can feel the coolness from those fingers gently moving around your forehead. And because your face and your head is quite warm from all that effort, all that hard work of climbing the mountain, it really accentuates the coolness from the fingers. And you feel that coolness, that almost a blue numbness, gently passing around the head so comfortably cooling the head and the face, helping you relax, helping your breathing calm down, helping you feel a sense of peace and tranquility. And you walk among the monks and you're searching for one specific monk and you walk among them and you look at each one as you walk and you can see one monk sat 
on the wall of the monastery, on the wall that goes around the outside of the whole building and the grounds, sat on a slight pillar on that wall, facing out over the view down the mountain. And you suspect that that is the monk you're supposed to talk to. And so you begin to walk towards them. And then a monk steps up to you and stops you and says that here in the monastery, you need to walk with intent. You need to walk mindfully. Don't just march over to somebody, but consider every step that you take. Consider the experience of each and every step. And not just the foot step, but the way the legs move, the way the muscles adapt to raise the lower part of the leg, to raise the upper part of the leg, to move the lower part of the leg forward, to adapt your balance so that you remain upright on the leg that's still on the ground, that lowers that leg back down to the ground, aligns the foot correctly, lowers the heel of the foot to the ground just enough so that it makes the correct contact with the ground before those changes happen in your body, to shift your body weight around, to allow you to be able to lift the other leg from the ground. And at first, this sounds complicated, sounds like you could end up overwhelmed by focusing that much on every little detail just of the process of walking. But they explain that by focusing on every detail, your attention narrows and you begin to become absorbed in the moment. And you can become so absorbed in the moment that your attention is on these things while at the same time not being on them at all. That you're just in a flow state. You're just in a state of knowing exactly what's happening moment to moment. But you're not attending to it with any kind of labels. You're not saying to yourself, I'm lifting this leg by using these muscles, by contracting those ones, extending those ones, shifting my body weight here. You just know what your body is doing. You know that you're walking. And so that's what you do. You begin to focus on the walking. And you walk in a slower, more measured way while you do this. And as you take these slower, more measured steps, at first, you think to yourself, it's a little bit like when a millipede is asked how it manages to walk with so many legs, or any other creature with many legs. And just the process of trying to focus on so much at once causes them to trip over those legs. And you think on some level about that occurring, about how much more difficult walking becomes when you're told to walk, when you're focusing on the walking. But while you overcome that inner difficulty, while you overcome that self-imposed difficulty, that difficulty by consciousness, you begin to allow it to become automatic. So it's automatic and yet it's what you're attending to. And in that moment, you stop noticing sounds around you you stop noticing movement around you. You stop noticing the sky. You stop noticing trees gently swaying. You just notice 
the experience of walking. And you almost feel in a strangely blissful state. A state that can perhaps start in your stomach or your chest. That can spread out, filling your arms and legs. And spread around to your head, all the way down to your feet. Almost like a tingling blueness spreading throughout you, almost sounding like a million gently swinging tiny bells, twinkling one after the other, creating an almost sparkly tingle around and through your body of those bells making that sound. And as you continue walking, you almost have this sense of tiny, sparkling bits of light emanating from you, as if somehow you're in your own time, separate from the external time, walking closer and closer to that monk, feeling at one with the moment, like in your experience, there's no past, no future, there is only now. And as you walk to that monk, so the monk turns to face you. They gesture for you to join them up on the wall. And so you climb up onto the wall. You sit down in a similar position to them, making yourself incredibly comfortable. And they tell you to just gaze off at that distant golden eagle that's circling overhead. And just watch, keep your head forward, and just raise your eyes to watch that golden eagle circling, and just keep motionless, keep your head forward and still, keep your body relaxed and still, and just focus on that golden eagle as it gently circles overhead, focus on the experience of the eagle, focus on the movement, not just of the wings, but of every single feather and every single strand on the feather and how every feather has a role to play in helping that golden eagle glide so gracefully and effortlessly and allowing your attention to be drawn into that into the sound that golden eagle makes while flying, by the way the wind moves over and under its wings, to the sound of its beating heart, to the sensation of its moving neck, to what that eagle can see gazing down over the landscape, what it can feel as it passes through different bits of air and how some air can raise it up and in other locations it can naturally lower down and give all of your attention to that golden eagle and so as you do this as you give all of your attention to that golden eagle, what you can see, what you can hear, what it would feel like flying up there. You begin to almost get tunnel vision here. Everything around your vision begins to fade away and almost turn to black. The monk begins to fade away, the monastery, the surroundings until all you're aware of is that eagle circling overhead. 
and then while aware of just the eagle circling overhead. So your attention suddenly snaps to being in the eagle, seeing through the eagle's eyes. And you realize from the perspective of this eagle that everything that makes up that you back there meditating on the wall of the monastery is back there. That here, in the eagle, through the eagle's eyes, you don't feel, see or hear anything that that you back there on the monastery wall sees, hears or feels. You just feel a floating, flying, relaxing sense of peace, of calm, of stability. A sense of invigoration at your experience. And a hyper-focus. And a complete lack of awareness of that you back there. And the experience of being that you back there on the monastery wall. And you allow yourself to fly as this eagle. To be going along for the journey. Almost like a shared consciousness. Like you're a consciousness in the mind of the eagle while allowing the eagle to carry out its own actions. And you're just there, along for the ride, along for the experience. And as you gaze down, so you can notice rivers running through forests, a low mist. You can notice clouds in the sky. You can notice the way the sunlight illuminates the surface of water, of those rivers, of pockets of lakes within the forest. And so you fly around for some time as this eagle, gliding, feeling so effortless, so free, free from the feelings of that you back there on that wall. And then you have this sense that although you can't hear the monk talking with you, you feel like the monk is talking with you, like somehow they're helping to guide your experience. And you begin to have this experience fading away of flying with this eagle. But you find that your experience doesn't drift to the you sat in the monastery. Instead, it drifts down into that forest. And you find yourself darting and buzzing between the trees. And you realize, as you hover over an area of water, that you can see your reflection. And you notice that you've turned into a green fairy. And you dart down near the water, and skim the water, creating slight ripples in that water, leaving a wake of sparkly light behind you everywhere you go. You fly up in the sky, you weave between the trees, and you realise that among the trees here in this forest seem to be many fairies, and many other creatures you may never ever have seen or realised were here. And as you fly, 
you have this sense that it's a bit like you've got a hummingbird being carried on your back. Just that sound of the buzzing wings. Just the way that they allow you to make manoeuvres that not even the most proficient fighter pilots could ever make. And you decide to test out what it's like being a fairy. You fly as fast as you can. You realise your senses are heightened, that you're able to respond rapidly, weaving between trees and branches. And then you slow down. You relax down onto a branch, and you gaze out through the forest. And while you relax there, still gently beating your wings, just keeping yourself on the spot, just helping to remain stationary. You're creating a slight mist of sparkling light that's gently beating from your back and slightly surrounding you. Before you dart off out of that sparkling light and head down to the grass on the edge of the forest, and you wonder why you're having this experience. You've gone from being in an eagle flying high in the sky to being this fairy. And you wonder if, as a fairy, you have the power to grant wishes or do any magic or do anything fun but you don't know how to do those things. So you try to think, what would a fairy do? And you wave an arm while making a magic spell that you just think of off the top of your head. And as you do that, you see the most unusual creature a donkey with the head and neck of a llama, walking past, eoring like a donkey. And on its back is a tiny, little, almost like a little person. And you head over and find that it's almost like a small troll that's riding on the back of that llama. And they say hello, and they seem incredibly friendly. And you wonder what else could be done with magic. You were trying to make a horse appear, but instead you had a donkey with the head and neck of a llama, ridden by a troll. So you try again. And again you want to try and make a horse appear. And you wave a hand and click a finger, and you hope this time it'll work. Only this time, suddenly, a moose walks past that seems to have a clockwork switch on its back. And that clockwork switch seems to be ticking along and turning as in a very rigid way that moose walks past and you decide not to try again and you wonder what it is you're doing wrong and then you hear a voice in your mind you realize it's the monk and you realize they're probably talking to you while you're sat on that wall and that voice tells you you're overthinking it. You're trying too hard. You're trying too hard to be something else. Rather than being yourself. You're trying to do magic as you imagine magic would be done. And that magic isn't done as you imagine it would be done. It's done as you instinctively do it. And that the only way to perform magic 
is to be magic. Magic isn't something you can do. It's just something you either are or you aren't. And you don't really grasp this at first. And you walk over to the edge of a lake your wings gently beating behind you. And you pick a small little yellow flower as you walk towards the edge of the lake. And you're aware of how big that flower is compared to you when you're so little. And you throw that flower onto the water's edge just over the wave line. And as those waves lap into the shore and then pull back from the lake's edge, so you watch that flower gradually moving out, bobbing up and down into the water. And then once it's out in the lake a little way from the shore, Sparkling starts happening around that flower. And that sparkling spreads from the petals outwards, creating almost like a sparkling hole in the water that's tinged with the yellow colour of the flower. And you feel this compulsion to fly to that hole and drop down through it. And so you fly out above the hole and you look down through the hole. And you see through the hole what looks like dry land. And you stop flapping your wings and you just drop straight down through that hole. And you find yourself suddenly being a person walking through a British village. And it's a quaint, small, quiet British village. And as you look around, so you realise that this village looks incredibly old. And it isn't that the shops or the houses look incredibly old. It's that the look of them is incredibly old. And you realise that somehow this seems like it's back in time. And so you walk through the village. And you head in to the main town centre, where you can see a row of shops. And as you walk past the shops, one shop catches your eye. And you realise that how you're dressed looks out of place compared to the people around you. And so you decide to go into this shop and see if you can find some new clothes, something different to wear in this shop. And so you walk into that shop. You pick some items up that you want to try on. You head to the back of the shop. You head into a changing room. You change into those clothes in front of a mirror at the back of this shop. And as you look at yourself in this mirror, you end up hearing sounds around you changing. And as you exit the changing room, you find that you're even further back in the past. That the shop itself seems to have changed. And you walk out of this shop and out into the road. And you look around with a slight sense of confusion. And you realise that something about that shop and that mirror seems to have transported you 
back into the past, even further than you'd already travelled. And you explore this time period. You listen to people talking, people going about their everyday life. And you head down to the nearby river. And you walk along the edge of that river. And you can see that there's a water mill along the edge of this river. And you head to that water mill. And you can hear the sound of the water wheel spinning the mill turning, and you can smell the smell of flour. And nearby the mill, you notice there seems to be a bakery, and you can smell that smell of freshly baking bread. And you take a look in the mill, and you see all the grains falling onto a grindstone. And you see as they pass onto the stone, they get broken down into smaller and smaller, finer and finer pieces. Until they're almost just like dust. And then they pass through. And they pass out. And they end up in a bag to be removed and taken away from that mill. And you watch as this happens for a while. And you have this sense of the way this mill is working. That it seems to at times add water to help lubricate. To help with the process of grinding that down. And help it more comfortable. As it grinds that grain down to the finest flour. And then one of the bakers comes in and begins to talk with you. And begins to explain about them having the finest, softest, fluffiest flour in the land that there is nowhere with softer, fluffier flour than there, that it's the way the mill works that creates that soft, fluffy flour, the way it breaks it down with the grindstone, the way it uses water to be able to flush that through comfortably, to be able to create that incredibly soft, flour, which passes through to a bag, and they gather it all up, they make sure it's all dried out, and then they bake with it, baking the fluffiest, most wonderful loaves of bread, and they take you through to the bakery, and as soon as you walk in, the smell you could already smell increases significantly. Suddenly you notice your mouth salivating. You notice your stomach waking up on hearing and smelling this bread being baked. As if your body is suddenly alerted to the pleasures of this bread. And they show you around and they give you a taste. Before you decide you've got to go. And so you leave here. You walk back towards that shop. And you have this instinctive feeling of knowing what you need to do. And back at the shop, you change back into those clothes. And as you change back into your normal clothes in front of that mirror, and you leave 
that changing room, you find that you're back in your own time. You're back in the time of the clothes. Except you're here in England. That you're not back in the time that you entered the shop in. You're back in your real time. And a part of you knows that while you're stood here in this English town, which still looks quaint, with many old shops and old buildings that now look like old shops and old buildings, you're aware that somewhere out there at exactly the same time, you're sat on the edge of a wall on a monastery in a mountain, meditating, and somehow projecting this you here with the help of that monk. And you walk through the town, you walk back down to that river, you find that there's only the remnants of that old bakery and the old mill. That it's now a footpath along the river and there's a cafe there now. And you head to a park and you sit in the park for a little bit watching people playing, watching people walking their dogs, watching the way the shadows of the clouds gently pass across the grass, curious what this experience is teaching you. You came to the monk to learn, to discover yourself, to connect deeply with yourself and with the world around you. Unsure what the experience would be, and the only criteria was that you had to show motivation, dedication. You had to show that you were willing to have the experience. You were willing to climb that mountain. You were willing to engage with the monks in the monastery and with the monk on the wall and then trust that monk enough to allow yourself to experience what they guide you to experience and to trust that those experiences are for your benefit to help you understand yourself and your connection with others and other parts of the world around you in a whole new way. And as you realize you're beginning to deeply understand, you begin to have a sense of the wind on your face. And you start feeling like you're sitting on that wall. And then you start to be aware of your body. And notice how incredibly comfortable your body feels sat here. That it's as if somehow you are here. And yet you've left behind those parts that you wanted left behind. A bit like taking all of the blocks that make something up and reforming them, putting them back together to something that looks very similar and yet is slightly different. Or in the same way that throwing a stone into a pool of water changes that pool of water so that it's no longer the same as it was before and yet to anyone else who looks at that pool of water. It'll look the same as it's always looked. They'd be unaware that a stone was thrown into that pool of water. 
that the water level is ever so slightly higher, that everything was moved because of that stone splashing into the water, passing to the bottom. All the atoms in that water carefully moved and jiggled about and changed places because of the stone. And yet only the person who threw the stone in would know that. And the monk climbs down off the wall and starts to walk towards the monastery. And you can tell from the way they're walking that they're walking with intent. And you begin to follow. And you follow the rules that you were told earlier. And so you begin to walk with intent. And you walk into that monastery where it's suddenly peaceful and incredibly quiet with just the slightest echo from the footsteps of the monk and from your footsteps as you walk into that monastery. And the monk turns and guides you down some steps. And the monk says there are ten steps and they descend into the dark. So it's best that you count your way down so as to safely walk to the bottom and that you'll go deeper into the monastery as you do. And things will become increasingly peaceful in that deeper chamber under the monastery. And so you begin to descend those steps. Ten, nine, eight, going deeper and deeper down those steps descending into the monastery, counting your way down as you go. Seven, six, five, four, three, with everything getting quieter and quieter around you. Two, one, and then hearing a slight echoing of the first footstep on the floor in this chamber. And then walking in the dark through this chamber, following where you feel the monk is walking. And then after a few moments, you notice the monk has lit a torch and then used that torch to light a flame. And with that flame lit, so this chamber becomes illuminated. And as this chamber becomes illuminated, so you notice the incredible mosaic on the floor, the repeating patterns, where when you look at one part, it looks like one pattern, and then as you zoom in on that pattern, you notice that it just repeats to a smaller and smaller scale, looking almost exactly the same, as if the same type of pattern is present, but looks subtly different. And so, a part of your attention is drawn to absorbing yourself in that pattern in following the pattern from the largest scale down to the smallest scale you can observe and then back out to the largest scale again and then back down to that smallest scale. And next to the flame that the monk lit is a bowl of water and the monk places some rose petals in that water, and as they float on the surface of the water, so they begin to give off the most beautiful rose fragrance. 
that you can just have a sense of wafting into your nose. And the monk tells you to put your hands in the water and gently pat your face with that water. Pat the water over your forehead. Close your eyes. Pat the water over your eyes. Pat it gently on your cheeks, on the side of your temple. And gently pat your face with that water. And as you do that, you can really notice that rose smell contained within the water. And once you've done that, and you open your eyes, and you dry your hands by rubbing them on your legs, you notice what look like ghosts or spirits walking around and standing around you in a circle. And you look around, and you see them all looking so friendly, gazing at you. And the monk explains that these twelve spirits watch over the monastery. They watch over those who come to the monastery. They share collective knowledge and wisdom that each of these twelve was once in charge of the monastery and when they passed on they became one of the twelve and that occasionally they pass on from their spirit form but they only do that at a time that there's another one of the monks to take their place, so that they can maintain at least twelve of them to be able to offer their collective knowledge and wisdom of all of the techniques, strategies they've learned, all they know about connecting with the world around them. That it was a number of years ago that one monk stumbled upon a way of being able to become one with the universal energy and to be able to almost become real as the energy, to be able to have consciousness in a single location contained within that universal energy and then powering that consciousness through deep thought, to be able to focus that energy on creating a spirit-like body, and that they realise that they can connect with the past, the present and the future through this universal energy that was there at the beginning of time and will be there to the end of time. And so, with the progress you've made, they're allowing you to access their counsel, to be here to ask questions. And they'll answer your questions. And they'll share knowledge. And they can share their healing and their wisdom. And so, they direct you to a chair. You sit down on that chair. One of the spirits comes over. They lay their hand gently on your forehead. And their hand feels so soft. With a very slight tingle to it. Almost as if you're being touched by silk. 
and the hand seems to give off a slight eucalyptus scent, as if something about this energy being, this process of being energy, gives off a eucalyptus scent that just seems to fill and clear the nostrils and helps you to breathe better and relax deeper. And they tell you to just take a few moments with your eyes closed to begin to breathe deeply and comfortably. And as you breathe so deeply and comfortably, just have a sense in your mind's eye of a pocket watch just gently swinging left and right left and right in front of you. Just have a sense of watching that pocket watch swinging left and right, left and right. And as you watch that pocket watch swinging left and right, having a sense of what that pocket watch would sound like. Maybe there's a swooshing sound as it swings left and right. And having a sense of all of your attention being on that watch. And while you watch that watch, having a sense of counting backwards from ten in your mind. And going deeper and more relaxed into the experience. Connecting yourself with the universal energy in a way that allows these twelve guides, these twelve spirits to share their knowledge, their wisdom, their healing with you, to be able to respond to any questions, any thoughts you may have, to be able to help you in any way you want help, and allowing you while you count down, to be able to formulate the question you would like to ask, and when you formulate that question you would like to ask, once you get to the count of one, you can ask that question, and they can communicate the answer. And they can communicate that answer in a period of silence. And when they communicate that answer in the period of silence, they may communicate it, with a word, a phrase, a sentence, or it could be with a feeling, a gesture, or it could be in a way that you just know or understand, or something you're going to discover, but you can be comfortable in the knowledge that they've communicated that, and that you can then use that knowledge Use that healing for your own well-being. Knowing you can always come and ask them questions again in the future. And so, once they've said that, you begin your counting down. Ten. Nine. Eight. Going deeper into the experience. Connecting deeper with that universal energy, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and then presenting the question, and then they can take their time to respond with their answer. And then you'll know on some level the answer has been received. That they're all knowing knowledge, wisdom, insights and healing are able to be used and transmitted back to you at this time. 
even if you forget later what it was and what it is and what it shall be. And then they remove their hand from your forehead. You have this feeling of them stepping back into their circle. You have a sense of relaxing there. And you almost feel this feeling around you of a warmth beginning to spread so comfortably down through the top of your head. Relaxing and spreading down through your neck muscles, your face muscles, down to your shoulders, down through your shoulders, down each arm to your fingertips, down your back, down your front, all the way down your sides, down to your legs, and that warmth, that comfort, spreading all the way down to your feet. And as that warmth and comfort spreads all around you, you begin to have that feeling almost like you're wrapped up in a chrysalis. Like somehow change is happening and you're being wrapped up with extra comfort and a deep sense of love and kindness. Almost like the most loving hug the most comforting hug that gradually, very slowly begins to release itself as you have this sense almost like you're unzipping and stepping out of a sleeping bag and being aware of being sat in that seat And as you rise from that seat, so you have this feeling like you've left something behind in that seat. Something you didn't need to take with you. Something that's right to be left right there. And you have that sense of it. As that monk is smiling at you. And you watch as those other twelve fade away and the monk leads you back out of this area back out of this chamber back up those steps back to the main part of the monastery and the monk tells you you've received what you came here to receive and you'll discover the changes from that over the next few days and you can come back and revisit regularly if you're willing to make the journey and willing to engage with the experience and the monk shows you on your way and so you head back down the mountain you head back the way you came. You head back through the forest, wondering if you can spy any of those green fairies. And you head all the way back towards your hometown. And as you head towards your hometown, on your journey, you see a fairground, and with that fairground, you see what looks like a zoo attached, and you go and visit those animals at the zoo. And they tell you that this is a travelling zoo, that these are all rescue animals, with the plan to release them back into the wild once rehabilitated. And so, they're kept as wild as they can in this setting. And that they have to meet certain criteria to be allowed here. They have to be able 
to be suitable to be able to go back into the wild. They're only here very temporarily for any given animal. Just for brief periods of support. And you look around at the animals here. And you seem to feel a deep connection with them. And then you head in to the fair. And you see a small tent. And you walk up. Being nosy, you look in the tent. And you see someone there, sat at a table. And you see that they have just laid out some tarot cards. And they call you over by name. And they tell you these are your cards. And they turn over a card and tell you that it's about your past. That you've had some challenges. That you sometimes doubt yourself. And yet try to portray an air of being confident. You still think of yourself as being really young. As not really being as mature as you try to portray yourself as being. That you really try to fit in. But find that it can be a struggle at times. And that sometimes people will tell you that you appear really confident. And you may smile. And you may pretend to agree. And yet internally, you worry that that's not actually you. That you're the same person inside your mind that you were when you were much younger. You haven't grown up with your body. That the person you see in the mirror is different to the person you feel like inside. And then they turn over the next card and they tell you that this is your present. And as you look at that card and listen to them talking, they tell you that you have worries. You have things you'd like to achieve and don't know whether you can succeed. That you have a dream that you'd like to follow, but are unsure where to start. And that it's hard sometimes to find the motivation to be able to start that thing you really want to do. That you've got a circle of friends, but only a few who you would class as really close. And that you'd really like to sometimes have a few more friends. Or even just that one friend that's just right for you. That you do have some great friends, but not necessarily that one special friend. And they start telling you about the present. And then they turn over a card. And they say, this is your future. And as they start telling you about the future, they tell you, You've just had an experience, and that something about that experience has made this card slightly cloudy, as if the future you would have been told just days ago has been shifted by some magical experience, some deep transformative experience, and that there's some pain in your life that can shift and change, that sometimes discomfort can turn into something better, can lead to opportunities where you can find some comfort contained even on the smallest level of that discomfort, like discovering an acorn in soil that nothing can grow in, and yet somehow, against all odds, with just enough water and nurturing, just the right amount of sunlight, that acorn grows and sprouts through. And somehow, despite everything trying to eat it down, everything coming over and trying to trample it, 
it manages to survive, manages to bounce back and grow taller and taller until it's too tall to trample. It's too tall for a rabbit to come along and nibble at it and eat it down. And it grows taller and taller. And while it's growing taller and taller, it faces many storms and is able to survive those storms because it just flexes and bends in the wind until it reaches a size where it's able to dig its roots in so deeply that in dry periods its roots are so deep they can still find water. In windy times its roots are so deep it remains upright and it stretches and reaches for the sky and lasts so gracefully with some scars on it caused by its journey, some scars from lightning, some scars from fire, some scars from droughts, many scars that show off the life that this tree has led, and yet here it is with the most beautiful, perfect green leaves, stretching to the sky, burrowed deep under the ground, giving life to the surrounding area. And they tell you that this is what that third card means for you. And they hand you that third card. And you turn the third card around and you look at it. And you see on that card a dove flying with a twig in its beak. With the view of an ocean in the background. And some distant islands. And some wispy clouds. And you leave this tent, placing that card in a pocket. And as you leave the tent and turn around, you find that the zoo and the fair seem to have vanished. And where they were is now just empty land. And you're curious about that. You continue your journey home. And on arrival home, You have the most comfortable bath with some candles that you light dotted around the bath. And you put the matches off to one side, relax yourself down under the bubbles, smelling that fresh pine smell given off by the candles, listening to something relaxing in the background, feeling the warmth of the bath, the tickling of the bubbles. And after deeply relaxing in the bath, you head to bed, you settle down in bed, and as you think about the experience you've had, you begin to drift and float comfortably asleep. And you begin to dream about that oak tree. You begin to dream about sitting in the tree, feeling the bark beneath you, touching the bark with your hand, feeling this sense of almost like by touching the bark of the tree you connect on a deeper level with nature and almost sense a communication between the tree and yourself and scurrying along one of the branches you see a squirrel heading over stopping looking over at you tentatively heading a bit closer flicking its tail a few times while it stops. Perching up 
on its back legs, holding its paws up in front, sniffing a little bit, heading a bit closer, gradually feeling a sense of deep trust for you, until eventually it comes all the way up to you, rests down on your lap, and lets you pet it gently, feeling its fluffy tail, feeling the warmth it gives off through its fur, forming that relationship with the world around you as you comfortably and relax drift and float asleep.